Hello, David Zritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. You can see by the thumbnail, we are talking everything Timothy Dalton. This is like a fantasy come true for many of you people. And, and, and by the way, years ago, and I mean going back years ago in the late 1980s, if I ever said to somebody, you know, we're, we're making your dream come true by talking about Timothy Dalton, you, you would call me crazy. But Timothy Dalton in the world of James Bond, in, in the Bond community, has really grown in the appreciation of so many people's eyes. Now, these are old eyes. You can tell by the wrinkles and the crow's feet and, and, and the cataracts that are clearly uh, coming up very quickly. So I decided to do an experiment. Now, stay with me on this because this is a bit of a social experiment. I had to engage a younger soul. And I don't know too many younger souls that you know walk across the street from me whenever I approach them. But I have one, and she is not just a movie aficionado. She's probably one of my favorite family members. Please don't tell anybody. Don't make it public. But she is, and I love to talk to her about movies. And she did the ultimate thing. Yes, she watched both Timothy Dalton movies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Marissa. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be back. You look great. By the way, since the last time you were here, this is crazy. Since the last time you were here, you've gotten married. Yes. And you've had a baby. Things have happened in my life since I've last been on you know, on the channel. Yeah. A couple things. I've, I've, but you know what? The positive with this is that I've been able to watch a lot of movies while on maternity leave. So, ah, okay. So how many movies a week would you say you're watching? Uh, right now I'm logging a movie a day. This oh year. my gosh. Like that's an apple a day. <laughs> that's, but that's amazing. It's probably uh, like an apple. It's probably keeping you healthy and sane. I definitely think so. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the quality of the movie. Um, we watched Wanted and Taken back to back last week. And I will say that those two movies maybe weren't the best for my personal movie watching diet, but you know. Nice. Yeah, you, you get what you get. You know what you need to do? You need to watch the Equalizer trilogy. I am very down. I've never seen a single one of them. And I think that's a tragedy because I've heard wonderful things. This is so up your alley. So I had a, a plane ride coming back from Spain and it's a very long plane ride. And I'm like, I've never seen one of these. Um, I'm going to watch all three of them. They had all three lined up. And I saw the first one. I'm like, this is great. I can't wait to watch the second one. And I watched <laughs> the second one. I'm like, Oh, maybe that was a miss. And then I saw the third one. I'm like, they should have stopped with the first one. See, that's a tragedy with sequels. But I don't think that the Dalton sort of duology suffers oh. from the same fate. Okay, great segue. Thank you for keeping us back <laughs> online. We're here to talk about home. And first of all, this is, this is something you and I talked about over, oh gosh, a year and a half ago. I went back into my text messages. Mm. What made you say to yourself, you know something? For Uncle David, I'm going to watch the Dalton films. What what transpired? So I think it's because we watched On His Majesty's Secret Service, which was just the one of the best Bond movies I had ever seen. Like it really, it was just so much fun. It was, a, it was such a romp. And so I just, I just wanted to go in order. I had not seen any of the Dalton movies. I was now well informed as to the quality of the of the one off of the George Lazenby. And so I just wanted to go further. And so now I have. And boy, it's it's a whole other experience. It's really yeah. interesting in that way. It is. And and by the way, just to set the table for everybody watching, because I have a particular audience, one of the things that I thought would be interesting and the reason why I asked Marissa is not just because of her amazing vernacular to movies. Um, a lot of it has to do with it's it's it is a generational gap. I mean, I'm 56. Sure. I won't say your age, but you are under 30. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So under 30, 56. It's going to be interesting how we tackle these. And again, Bond fanatic, um, casual Bond fan, but you are a Bond fan. Yes, absolutely. By virtue of living in this family, there is no way I wouldn't have been able to get away with at least watching. I don't know. Because I know where you live. under my belt. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Do you have a favorite Bond film, by the way? So viewers who have seen me on this channel before will note that I have said in the past that No Time to Die was 
my, maybe not my favorite, but at least, no, I had said Skyfall was still my favorite. Skyfall is still my favorite. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, that's great. Like that. I love Sky, that. But you know, in the same way that, and I've explained this before, in the same way that when you're growing up, when you first see Bond, whoever that Bond is, if it's more, if it's Connery, yeah. I feel in my heart that the person that you grow up with doing it is your Bond. And Craig mm. was my Bond. Interesting. Um, and by the way, I'm not going to put bras in. No, but this is an interesting discussion and it is the beginning of it because we talk about baggage anytime you watch any movie there's mm -hmm. certain baggage that you bring in with you it's it and by the way you are an accumulation like i'm an accumulation of your experiences and, and movies are no different so Absolutely. when i saw the very first dalton movie the living daylights in the late 80s i was coming from the world of roger moore roger moore was my james bond here now in this conversation in 2024 you came at Dalton and really your, your, your kind of foray into James Bond was Daniel Craig. That was some of your baggage, but you had yeah. seen a lot of the other films. Sure. I, my first Bond film, as I was growing up, as I was, you know, maturing into an adult, Daniel Craig was my Bond. But the first Bond movie I ever saw was Live and Let Die. Oh. So, so wow. there's, yeah, we have a lot of wires, like, that are crossing and firing at the same time. You're an old basically. soul, is what you're saying. I really love that movie. Wow, I, and I do too. It's actually my favorite Roger Moore. But but with Dalton, one yes. more piece of baggage I want to talk about. Sure. Did you come to the table before you pressed play on the very first one? And by the way, I assume you saw them in order? Yes. Okay. When Before you press play, was there anything in your mind, and I, I can't remember if I had said anything, thinking to yourself, all right, a lot of people ding Dalton or a lot of people ding Dalton, ding dong. Um, did, was there anything that was sort of lowering your expectations for these films? If anything, and it, I mean this with the most kindness in my heart, Dalton to me, whenever I saw him, and I think this is because of his previous filmography and the things that he's done also in media, he has a villain's face. Ooh. And so as I like that. began to watch the movies, I had trouble not seeing him as a villain, not seeing him as nefarious. And we'll talk about that. And it's interesting too, because in the end, we'll we'll get into the psychology of that, is that you know, Bond Fleming. Ian Fleming wrote him as a very unlikable character. If you read the books, mm. he is not a hero. He is just an unlikable, you know, he drinks too much. He does too much of this. He kills too much. He's an, un and by the way, he'll do anything and everything for queen and country at the time. Um, so let's open up the doors of sure. Timothy Dalton. So you watch Living Daylights. Were you, did you watch it alone? Did you watch it with your husband? So I watched The Living Daylights twice. What, Not once, what? I saw it twice. Yeah, I saw it two times. Can I ask why? Because the plot is a little overplotted at times. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I understood the beats correctly. Okay. All right. So let's, so, you know what? You've arrived at uh, Resort The Bond Experience, and you, I want you to unpack your bag. Tell me about the movie. Tell me about first impressions, plot, just go for it. So we, I think my, I, I had hills and valleys with The Living Daylights, I will be honest. Um, you know, when he's, you know, doing sort of a sniper v sniper in the very beginning, I'm like, absolutely, yes. This makes a lot of sense. He's, you know, kind of sly, little fox-like Bond. I like that but that didn't really progress much. It was kind of a quick little one-off, but didn't end up being like a huge, huge, huge set piece. Some of the valleys, I, boy, I, and we'll talk about this. I'm not a huge fan of Kara. I, not my favorite. Yeah, unfortunately, she's just not my favorite. And so when she was on screen, I just was like, mm, I was, I was butting up against that a little bit. There were times and, but I think also the stunts in the movie also had me kind of, I was really enjoying them. I thought the stuff that they put the planes were amazing and very inspired. 
I don't know. I'm a, I'm a mixed bag when it comes to the living daylights. Okay. And that's where I sat the first time I saw it. And I was hoping with a second watch with more informed eyes, I would feel differently. I do not. All right. So then it's confirmed that it's yes. kind of a mixed bag. It's interesting. So a little bit of knowledge for you. Um, and we had talked about this when we spoke on the phone, that script was tweaked. I will say for Timothy Dalton, but originally mm. that script was written for Roger Moore. So it, the, some of the some of the stunts and the campiness and which they dialed down because you can't have the same Roger they dialed Moore. Dialed that down. Believe it or not, they dialed it down because with Roger Moore, the camp is at an eleven yeah, out of ten. Yeah, yeah. Um, they yeah. dialed it down to probably a nine, but a lot of people say Dalton was could have been a serious bomb, but he was put into kind of sillier plots and sillier situations. And maybe even like Koskov, you know, surrounded by silly ca uh, characters that are just over the top actors. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the people in the film, some of the, and by the way, there's multiple bad guys. There's not just one bad guy. There's like three yes. or four bad guys, which yes. is kind of unusual for a Bond Whitaker, film. Whitaker, Koskov, like, you know, like you're kind of, there's a lot of layers to the cake. Um, and they're trying to, you know, bake it all at one point um, and one time. And well, so it, sometimes it feels a little. Uh, I want to. I want to start with um, the Bond girl because okay. I. I tell you what. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'll share first. So you, you know, comfort level here. Um, Mariam Debo as as an actor is amazing. Um, she's mm -hmm. she's a she's still a Bond ambassador for the world of yeah. James Bond, and I really appreciate that. Very nice. This is not my favorite Bond girl. Um, and a lot of it is, it's really two reasons for me. Number one, um, she seems in many cases, except at the very, very end, as a spectator. She doesn't yes. seem like uh, other Bond girls that I love um, either move Bond to a different level of emotion or they move the plot along. Yes. And I don't think she does anything. I think it's like, yeah. check, there's a Bond girl. But the other thing is, I feel like there's no, the chemistry between her and Dalton seems very scripted and it does not seem natural. At times, she almost feels like an audience placeholder. She's asking the questions mm. that the audience is asking themselves, which is good, but not really the best for her character who I feel, and I, I think you kind of are spot on with that. I feel like generally, but especially with her, the script is working, it's sweating. It's it's just trying to make the beats work, it's trying to make all the connected lines fit together. Again, because there are so many villains, how are they connected? You know, we have Whitaker, we have the arms deals, we got the opium, all these things are just trying to tie together. How is she connected? She's Koskov's girlfriend, does she believe him? They're in Austria, who cares? Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's all happening at once. So I kind of feel like, I felt like with, I think you're spot on with writing the script, they were like, and we have a Bond girl. She just loves James Bond. Yeah. Excellent, wonderful news. That's kind of it. She almost, uh, this is a terrible thing to say out loud, but she almost seemed like an accessory. Like, you know, you yeah. need someone else. She gets in the... dragged along from to set piece to set piece, but she does not actually, tragically, she does not really do that much. And I'm going to just connect a little thread here. Yeah. Unlike Bouvier, who is a general helping hand, yes. she's out there flying the planes. And, and before someone comes at me, I know that Kara does fly a plane almost into like a cliff face. I have a nice audience. They're not going to come at you. They're going to love you as they loved you on the last one. They're like, get rid of David. Where's Marissa's YouTube channel? Which by the way, in the link, this is like everybody's wish 14 minutes in. Um, Marissa, you, you started uh, an Instagram channel with reels where you talk about movies. I do. They're very, very short, sort of one minute. Hey, by the way, I saw this movie. This is why you should watch it. Um, I watch a really wide range of genre. I don't just do horror and I don't do just this century. So if you're looking for action, foreign film, drama, romantic comedy, I kind of try to run the gamut. It's sort yeah. of whatever I feel, whatever I like to buy on Blu-ray. So feel I free like to that. Me there. All right. So 
to that point, um, mm -hmm. we have to then talk about, and we can we can we can jump a little bit. We got to sure. talk about the bad guys in this mm. film. We got to kind of break mm -hmm. this down. Sure. Um, and I always ask the same question of bad guys, and that is that: Do they move the plot along? Does it seem like a reasonable and heightened threat to Bond? And are they interesting? So uh, let's break it down person by person, Do it. because we got we got we got some people. Koskov, I think, is a pretty interesting character. I like how he hot and cold no matter who you know was the soul who was the body in front of him completely changed his face i think that's a really interesting character i like how cowardly he was yeah that's really cool to me i i haven't seen that many villains that are really that truly cowardly and so i thought that was interesting yeah whitaker on the other hand is interesting i like his characterization of all his little toys I thought that was cool. They're just, neither one of them really has enough screen time yeah. to really make their presence truly known in a way that feels nefarious. Does that make sense? It does. And I don't feel like they were connected enough too. Like I know no. that the plot connects them, but it, I didn't feel like this was a, a team that was, you know, no. Gestalt, you know, that one plus one equals three. And exactly. I'll tell you the other thing with Whitaker too is, and this is, I'm sorry, this is the actor too, because he was also in Goldeneye. It's so over the top, you know, it's so mm -hmm. gangy that um, I just, I don't know, the believability, he was just kind of like a buffoon. Um, and so I just didn't didn't connect to it that well. I definitely agree with you. I def I As I was watching, I don't know if, you, if anyone else got this sense, and this might just be the, you know, millennial and me talking his face he looks so much like philip seymour hoffman <laughs> and so for a second i was like mm, in like a different world we could be getting like mission impossible three vibes mm -hmm. where this is like a much more darker like interesting character and like obviously right. philip seymour hoffman was never going to play whitaker but like in my wildest dreams maybe he would because he kind of looks like him anyway i i feel like that was one of the many moments in this movie where I felt like, and, and you, I didn't know that this script was originally for Roger Moore. It makes sense. He's the camp. He's yeah. part of the camp. He's part of, of this movie. Exactly. And you can feel patchworks of where they pulled things out and put things in because Dalton doesn't work with camp that well. In my personal opinion, it yeah. just, his face and camp, I don't, those things are not equal sign. Like it doesn't compute. And I feel for like me personally. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I know it's extremely divisive and I will accept it on the chin. Quantum of Solace is a very divisive film because it is a very dark, somber. Here's an assassin trying to do a job rogue film. And it is a serious film from the bad guy all the way through. In this film, I feel like you have a mixed bag where you have camp mixed with they're trying to be serious. And because of that, I, I don't have an evenness to this movie. Yes. I, I, even, even at the end of the film, when they, you know, the, um, are they Pakistan? I mean, the. They're in Soviet controlled Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Thank you. But the Af fact that you don't really know that is not good. <laughs> It's not good. It's not, it's good. not good. It's not good. By the way, it's not good because here's a 56 year old that doesn't know geography. But in addition, I wasn't told. <laughs> I was not told. told. Where were? We? Where are right. we now? But but here's the thing. Okay, so is it about diamond smuggling, putting things in an organ case, or is it about stuff happening in Afghanistan? Like, help me as the audience. You don't. This is why I watched this movie two times because I was not truly sure what the aim of the of the villains was because it changed. They got to Afghanistan and all of a sudden it was about an opium deal. And I was like, who, but where, why? Why are we doing this? Why right. are we doing this? There is right. no reason for this other than maybe you had already booked a trip to Afghanistan or, <laughs> and so you were wow. just like, we're filming. So we're going to have to film something here. We have to explain that. I, I mean, that doesn't make sense to me either. Also, going back real quick to Quantum of Solace, I feel like those these two films kind of have a similar 
sort of DNA in that way because huh? Quantum, didn't Quantum Solace have writing issues because of the writer's yes, strike? they did. Okay, well, that's sort of a similar thing. Where yeah. It ends up being kind of, unfortunately, an issue in the writer's room. Yeah. Now, I, no I fault will, of the actors. I will say that to put a little bit of salve on the uh, movie wounds that we're creating, um, I do like Dalton. I like his entry point. I think he's Me got that too. steely look. Oh, wait, but what, what is this? Dun, dun, no, this is, is, this this thing is on? not this is not a dunk session. This is not a dunk session, and that's because of the movie we'll talk about next. Okay, but let's stay on this one because I do want to talk. Yes. About, I mean, I know that when I was introduced, and even when I revisit Dalton in The Living Daylights, I enjoy the fact that here is a Bond again that is a serious assassin, but he still mm -hmm. can have fun. He's still doing yeah. the romance thing, the Vienna thing. He, mm -hmm. he still has the quips. Um, and you know what? I'm going to say it too. I kind of like his look in this film as well. In, in terms of look, what do you mean by that? So I think he looks the part of Bond. And I know that's horrible to say, and I'll be, you know, I'll have people burning my lawn pretty soon, but I think he's got that kind of hardness to him that yes, I would the agree with best that. Bonds do, the ones that are just, I don't know, they're, they're unapologetic in, in killing. Yes, I believe with my whole heart that Timothy Dalton means every kill that he does. Like I, between the both of the movies, that is the most believable thing about Timothy Dalton is that when he kills someone, I, I, I think that he means business, which is good. Yeah. I don't always feel that with Roger Moore, depending on the script. So that in that way, I think he's a very effective bond. I think I have a little bit more trouble when the camp is turned up, when he's mm. sledding with a cello. And like cello, a cello, cello. Yeah, cello, that cello. that has me. He just doesn't have the face of a guy who would be like, "Yeah, you're right. This is probably the best way to like make yeah. it escape. Let me go into like a shack across." He can't do life. the arched eyebrow, Roger Moore. Like Roger Moore, when he does it, it's charming and funny. But yeah. I, I, I think you're right. I think without it, it's difficult. I think it's just difficult. I, I, I like Dalton the most when he's just going through sort of serious line. What's the X, Y, and Z of what's going on? Right. Where do I go next? You know, and then also confrontations that are serious. That's when I think Dalton is cooking. Yeah. But now I, there, I, I want to get your opinion before we move on to license to kill one last sure. thing. A lot of people tend to, I'll use the word adore when I don't use that lightly, adore the Madagascar, not Madagascar. I can't believe I said that again. Um, Gibraltar, Gibraltar, oh, um, the locations, you know, the ice lake, the props, the gadgets, the cars. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of tropes sure. that James Bond uses in this film to great effect. Were you able to um, just let yourself escape and enjoy those in the process? I think so. I think th for me, the most, one of the, the most impressive Bond aspect of this movie to me was the very end with the plane stunts. I was, they, they like bumped the budget up for those. Yes. Like of him and falling they did out. For real. And it looks like it's done for real. It's amazing. I was, I, as I was watching it both times, I was like, it, it was one of those, how do they, how do they do this moments? Yeah. Which for me, for the Bond film, that's a huge check mark, like amazing. You know, for cars and things like that, I just simply don't know enough about cars. So if I see a pretty car, I'm like, ah, oh, pretty car, wonderful. But him falling out of the plane, you know, grabbing the net, fighting with a knife, that was amazing. That's yeah. really, really cool. And I'm glad that that was at the end because it does put a really great end point and flourish on the movie in which, you know, as I've said, there's hills and valleys. So I feel like the final fight scene is just is quite, quite effective. So this is really an uneven movie for you. That's all. Yeah. There, when it's great, it's great. Okay. And when it's not, it's not. And I'll tell you, I, I, I am so intrigued and compelled because now I want to jump. I, I have to. I, I got to get your opinion. Because I, by the way, you, one thing, viewer, that you should know about this is Marissa and I don't sit here for 30 minutes before we do this. Like, literally, we got on. I asked her what she's drinking. 
and she mm-hmm. showed me and she's got a, she's got a backup Coca-Cola. There we go. There mm-hmm. we go. Sparkling water. She doesn't get paid. And then we go. So I have no idea what she's going to say about License to Kill. But before you tell me about what you thought overall about License to Kill, set the table again. Do you immediately jump into another Dalton after the Living Daylights or do you give yourself a break? I had a two month break. Oh, two months. (laughs) I watched the Living Daylights roughly three days after my son was born. Uh, watched it again like three weeks later took oh two God. months and then i watched license to kill so i had a lot of time to marinate wow okay yeah. yeah and then before i did this video i re-watched little pieces of both just because that's all right so you're well yeah. marinated in, in yeah. the movie mm-hmm. so yes. You're coming off Living Daylights. It's a little bit uneven. There are parts that you like, and you watch License to Kill. Thoughts? Love them. What? This is amazing. <laughs> I love License to Kill. I thought it was so much fun. You and Calvin Dyson. Great. Seriously, there is this other <laughs> like 30-ish um, guy who does this type of stuff in I England. Calvin, I've seen your movies. Or is he, oh, you've videos. seen them. Yeah. He loves yeah. License to Kill. Yeah, so, great. all right, what did you love you about it? got a Calvin. <laughs> what did I like about it? What did I not like about it? I thought, unlike The Living Daylights, this plot was tight. Mm. We have a villain. His name is Sanchez. He's a bad guy. He's in lots of scenes. You get to see him with everybody. What is he doing now? He's hanging with Lupe, sort of the secondary Bond girl. Cool, awesome. She, he's, and I, I feel like this is kind of strange for me to start at the villain, but because the villains were kind of like all over the place with the living daylights, having one strong central villain for License to Kill was really refreshing for me. It was quenching. Is what it, it was, was quenching to my thirst, exactly. And I personally really liked Sanchez. I liked his whole vibe. I love him. Every room that he was in was beautifully decorated. His iguana had gorgeous collars. He was like, he had such a great energy about him. Half the time, I mean, he was sadistic, but sometimes he's just like a businessman just trying to like make it all work, just chatting with his counterparts from around the globe. Like, (laughs) Sanchez was an interesting character to me. I mean, Sanchez, I'm, I'm, I, if my smile could break my cheekbones, it would right now. Sanchez is one of my favorite bad guys. This is not my favorite Bond film by far. Like in the okay. rankings, it's mm-hmm. it's in the like unfortunately the bottom three, and I'll get into why in a second. But sure, as a bad guy, he has he's almost like Silva in Skyfall. Silva is my number one favorite bad guy. Period. And it what <laughs> the rats? <laughs> my grandmother knew. Um, <laughs> point 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 point. But but Sanchez has that same thing where he will capture the scene. Yeah. Your scene is gone if Sanchez is in it. I don't even care if mm-hmm. Timothy Dalton's in there because he's so he, he wraps you into what he's mm-hmm. doing. He's very bo- by the way, this is considered by Bond fans as the most realistic, gory, and down to earth. James Bond movie. What Dalton needed. I think this is what mm. Dalton needed. And I'm so happy that he got a movie like this. Tell me about that. Like what what is it in Dalton in License to Kill that you think is retribution? Dalton has these eyes, these sort of really piercing eyes that when he's furious, you feel it with your whole body. He doesn't have a chance to really feel like portray that fury in the living daylights so you know having this be a quest for revenge you can really feel the vendetta coming Mm -hmm. through the screen and with dalton as pointed as he is as sort of you know he is handsome but like he is also somewhat vindictive it feels like sometimes and i don't know if it just again his previous filmography painting a story for me but when he was on a war path i believed it yeah he comes across as which is exactly how you want bond to be ruthless 
you know, because you have a ruthless yes. bad guy. And if you have a, a slightly weakened good guy that's just there for the heroicism, it can it can also be weakened, the plot. Um, and by the way, let's speak about the plot because th from what I'm hearing from you, this does move along pretty well. I feel that way, yes. Yeah, I, I felt like every single scene served an excellent purpose on top of also looking quite good. Great stunts. Mm. Also, let's please mention Benicio Del Toro. He's a very important actor to my generation. Honeymoon. Honeymoon. <laughs> when he showed, when Dario showed up on the screen, I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing here, bud? <laughs> and let me tell you, he ate up every single scene as, 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 as I expected. Yeah. Um, you said something okay. interesting. I want to dissect a little bit. You said mm -hmm. everything looks so good. One of the reasons why License to Kill gets dinged, and by me, I will I will admit, is the people that were hired to do the film itself are the same people that did Miami Vice television ser series, and they did the music as well. And to me, I've always said that this film, although there are moments I like, does come across as a late 80s TV series. Like the way it's That's shot, fair. it doesn't have that sumptuous technicolor and boldness of locations and i don't know it's i don't in that part in that part it seems to weaken for me i the reason why i particularly disagree is because i feel like Ooh. the locations that they're they're at feel real mm -hmm. they feel so yeah. like when they're at a bar in it was in miami or something like that yeah something yeah like, in some miami Florida. yeah well yeah you can feel the florida of right. it all and that is kind of cheap by nature. That's true. It's like, you know, it's kind of roadhouse. They were in Key West, which again, yeah. it has that Miami Vice type of feel. And yeah, so yeah, of course it's not gonna feel sumptuous because the locations themselves are not sumptuous. Mm. They're sort of down and dirty and in rougher spots. He's blowing holes through this random, <laughs> you know, <laughs> bayside bar. So like, no, it's not gonna look like Austria yeah. because it's not. And that's okay because I feel like it's at least accurate to the locations that they're at. You you laid down some serious seedlings, some hints earlier in this conversation about 15 minutes ago, where mm -hmm. you talked about the other Bond girl. And we let's Ooh, yeah. let's let's talk about the Bond girls in this film. Sure. Why did you like them so much more here? And who did you like? Because there's a few. I think Lupe is beautiful. So and Lupe is kind of the, the person. Yeah, she's just really pretty. So, you know, she's kind of does sort of the same thing as Cara does in the first movie where she's like, James, you can't go as she like gently pets his face. <laughs> same kind of thing. Like when she well, shows noticed. up. It's, right. Yes. Yeah, so it's like the same sort of characterization. But for whatever reason, I didn't mind it as much because there was also Bouvier who you meet her immediately and she's like listen i'm here for a job i am and she says this i am a professional so like don't mess around with me and i was yeah. like excellent wonderful because those are kind of the bond girls i like the most is when they have their own agenda other yeah. than i have been entrapped by the villain yeah or i'm like suddenly infatuated with you for no reason other than the fact that you are a very good looking man so bouvier had her own destination mind she had her own yeah. background and, and with the movie she has a lot of other things going on i liked that i personally like that so even if you know she wasn't as incredible of an actress as i don't even know vesper right um you know i still feel like there was a lot going on a lot more going on i agree i thought she was great the other thing I really liked what she did in this portrayal, and, and I'm sure the writing had a lot to do with it, is this is one of the first Bond films where it straddled the line of you had a very, you had a, you had a very competent Bond girl um, in what she could do. Absolutely. But she could also fall for James Bond. Like, I feel like yeah. there's been this, especially today in 2024, and I'm sorry, I'm going to say it, but it's my niece and I feel very comfortable. I feel like there's such a restriction in having a, a, a bond fall for a girl and a girl fall for a bond. It just, it's like, no, you can't do it. That's so old fashioned. But I think in this film, 
they pay it off really successfully. I think it's complete. I'm going to give my generation's opinion on this. I think oh, it's no. Complete, well, oh, no. we got to go. See you, Marissa. All right. Well, thanks, Marissa. So, <laughs> no. Terrible. I think it's completely fine and makes a lot of sense for women to fall for James Bond. James Bond is an attractive man who is extremely intelligent and athletic and is really cool. It makes sense. It makes yeah. sense. It's really more as to whether or not the woman herself is interesting in tandem. Right. Because James Bond has years, years, actors on actors of history padding yeah. him. A woman in these movies, they only have like, I don't know, Moments. max, like five minutes to really introduce herself. Yeah. So that's true. it really, th that introduction really needs to do something. Yeah. Did you, yeah. Did you notice, I mean, because I, I'm fascinated that, you know, you saw this and you, you saw it again, but did you notice that the violence was turned up or the, I don't know if it's the violence or, I mean, you had people blowing up in laundries and like, you know, you had uh, you know, people being eaten by things and, the, you know, Felix get his gets his legs eaten off. I mean, this is, it's slightly more violent. Did that affect you did you think it was just justified yeah this is we're talking about the cartel here good this is this yeah. is what it is it would be weird if it wasn't and it makes sanchez's character so much more interesting because right. on a dime he'll go from you know, sort of sort of sweet interesting charming in a boardroom with a bunch of other drug dealers you know petting his iguana in another minute, he's blowing up someone's head because of underwater pressure. Yeah. That's cool to me that someone can sort of switch on a dime. So I feel like that really enhanced the movie for me. The yeah. violence is the point. Yeah, it is. It's the cartel, like you said. And we got to yeah. we we can't shirk our duties because people signed in to talk about James Bond. True. Now that you have the comparison between the two movies. Talk to me about Dalton with License to Kill. I mean, did you did you see this vast improvement, or did you yes. like him just better in a better story? I just felt like he was more comfortable with the material. Hmm. In my in my personal one off, you know, opinion, I felt like as he was moving through the script, as he was doing the stunts, as he was reading the lines, I felt like he was truly emphatic about everything that he was giving. He was, you know, when he was performing the stunts, when he was doing the line reading, he, he was giving it all. And I feel like that made a lot more sense for this movie. It made, made me believe him more as a Bond, Yeah, really. I liked seeing him sort of dingy and dirty and bloodied up, getting rocked by two ninjas, okay. <laughs> I love the sound effects in that scene. That you know, and you really think he, yeah, you're like, wow, he's, he blew up Sanchez's window. Oh, what's going to happen here? Oh, two ninjas. Oh, we couldn't get that close. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, I think we that's held over from the left. Roger Moore <laughs> error, maybe. Yeah, was, I don't know. Yeah. I, I tell you what, there's a lot of people, more and more nowadays, I would say, that are gravitating towards. Timothy Dalton's license to kill persona more than the living daylights because mm -hmm. of that very reason that he's got to be rough and tumble. He's angry. I mean, but he, he's angry, he looks with, angry with a, with something like to do like a mission on him, which is very effective when it comes to Dalton. You feel like Dalton's not playing against who he is. Yes. Agreed. And, and, and I think for me particularly, he's not the kind of, he is not the kind of actor. He's got a great face for villainy. He's got a great mm. face for violence. Yeah. So I have a hard time when he's playing against that. Well, all right. So let's bookend this conversation because in the beginning, when I asked you about kind of first impressions, you said it was difficult because the the filmography, as you said, of Dalton was a lot of villainy and you had a hard time because you saw the villainy. Did the villainy aspect help you in License to Kill 
Yeah. Because he was playing a son of a bitch. Yeah, hundred percent. Agreed. Yeah, no. Fitting into the right pair of shoes, then fitting into Roger Moore. There you so. go. I'm fighting words. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Now, play is after this. There was an incredibly long hiatus, almost five years. Legal issues more than anything else, and Goldeneye with Pierce Brosnan yeah. um, and what a difference that was as far as tone and tenure have you seen Goldeneye not recently not enough that I can speak to it okay so maybe what we'll do is maybe we'll take a Brosnan film because what I'd love to talk to you about next is the dichotomy the the gap you know the chasm if you will between mm -hmm. Dalton, hard hitting. You're so excited. You love this movie. You're ready to tell the world to go see License to Kill and then making a jump to Pierce Brosnan, which is a big jump. That is a big jump. Uh, 100%. I just, it makes me kind of sad though that Dalton had didn't have another chance to make a movie. Do you know? Bond. There is a book, and it's, it's by a gentleman named Mark Edlitz who has discovered not one, but two scripts that they had ready to go. That if they didn't have all these legal issues, they were gonna film another Dalton movie. And this one was going to, it sounds like it could have been like bat s crazy in the sense of they were like robots, like killer robots and things like that. Like these little fighter robots and stuff. That sounds but, like Moonraker. <laughs> It could have been his Moonraker. Who knows? Maybe, oh, maybe it was no. bad. That, could they stop? But they did. They had two scripts, and they were all ready to bring Dalton back. And then there was such a long hiatus that they decided to go in a different direction with Brosnan. But a lot of people would have loved to have seen Dalton come back. I am. I'm happy he got this, Champ. I'm happy he got licensed to yeah. kill because I was happy to see him sweaty and bloodied out in these sort of sets that I think so can you explain to me why this is bottom oh. three for you let's go back to that for a second take a long um, set. it is it, it's it's a lot of things um the reason I watch James Bond films typically is to have a therapeutic sense of fun and escapism this is mm. so real it's the reason why no time to die keeps falling down my rankings because yep. <laughs> he's got he's got a kid and he dies and i'm like boy i have kids and i don't want to die i don't want to die <laughs> i mean they're just every time they do that in a bond film it gets a little less enjoyable for me or or if the bond film doesn't take me away and this film Maybe it's the way it's shot. Maybe it's the realism that you actually enjoy of the kind of the 80s Florida type thing. Again, something like Thunderball, which allows me to go to the Bahamas, beautiful vistas, or you only live twice, takes me to Japan. And I really feel like I'm immersed in the moment. I don't, I feel like I'm sort of watching a TV version of James Bond in this case. Did you feel that even with some of the stunts in this are really good? Oh, the like when the tractor amazing. trailer goes sideways yeah. like that. I looked that up. Apparently that was a practical effect. That sounds that's not TV. It's a, it's a practical <laughs> effect. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, amazing. And don't get me don't get me started on the fireball at the end that shows um an actual like demon in it. So what? so real quick. <laughs> what? Like a couple days before that effect was done where Sanchez blows up and the whole like trailer, you know, Tra tractor trailer blows up um a a bus of nuns which sounds like a joke you know a bus of nuns went off a cliff or something like that or they 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 got killed on like one of the cliffs right by the filming and when they blew that up if you freeze it and you you can look this up you see these like fingers these like demon fingers come up from the fireball and kind of reach down like the chiller effect from the 70s. And that doesn't add like a half star for you? Um, I will say this. If I was to do my ranking right now, and you and Calvin have a lot to do with this, I would say that this film would go up higher than my bottom three. That's great. Maybe my bottom <laughs> five. <laughs> That's very, very generous of you. But by the way, by the way, by the way, 
bottom five James Bond films to a James Bond fan is still better than most films. No, I understand. It's still like your 25 favorite movies of all time. Yes. I, I, yes, I get that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, License to Kill obviously is my favorite of the Dalton films. Is it my, is it in my top five of James Bond movies? No, of course not. Oh. It is not. No. Okay. It's top 10. It's top 10. Is it really? That's great. Yeah. And by the way, I, I should say this out loud, certainly to you, is I love when people say to me, how on earth could you not like dot, dot, dot? I love it when people defend even a view to a kill, you know, the Roger Moore's last mm -hmm. film, because it makes me think to myself, I need to rewatch it. What am I missing? Yeah. Have I missed something? Like, I, honestly, I, I yeah. need to like go back and see some of these other th films again. And anything that drives me to a Bond film, I'm a cheerleader for. It's all yeah. good. And speaking of that, because I know people are going to ask, we need to talk about what is our next film discussion going to be. What haven't you seen? Of the let's see. Well, because I want it to be fresh for you. I have you seen all the Craig films? Craig? Yes, I've seen all the Craig. Yeah, I've seen all the, all the Craig. Movies. Have you seen all the um, Brosnan films or no? No, no, I have not. Oh, I, I think actually this would be a good chance for me to go through Brosnan. From Let's go beginning. through Brosnan. Why don't we start yeah. with Goldeneye? Yeah, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah, start start with Goldeneye, and then we'll work our way through. And because they're very different, um, I can almost forecast that there will be certain Brosnan films that you like much more than others. I mean, is that sort of just sort of a universal truth? It is not only a universal truth; it's a universal knowledge of my niece of what you like and which storyline uh bond girls environment i think i think i'm starting to create a, a file on marissa and and i can mm. almost guess which ones are going to reach your pinnacle versus the ones that are like oh they just missed it did this particular living daylight slash license sale did this line up with your prediction no I thought you were oh, gonna like Living Daylights even... more than License to Kill. Uh... <laughs> oh, I'm all I, I'm all messed up. No, that's fair. I was just curious. I I was doing a little bit of sort of research on both of these movies, and um, not that much, but a little bit. And I did read that The Living Daylights is a valued film amongst the community. Yeah, and people in the comment section can let me know. They can you know tell me tell me how you're feeling. Tell me how you're feeling. In but this, in this Dalton moment. aficionados, people that really enjoy Timothy Dalton, I've seen them really gravitating to License to Kill because it's a better mm. portrayal of the darkness that he can bring to the character. Yeah. And that's why I liked it point blank, really. And also, Sanchez, as you said, Sanchez is one Sanchez, of the Sanchez, Sanchez, Sanchez. All day I, long. I know I'm sorry to talk about Sanchez, all the, but like he's in so much of this movie for great reasons. Yeah. And Robert like Davi, the um, the actor, is uh, he, he? He's a character. I mean, he is a character, but he's also an incredible supporter of the fans. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and and that does give me extra points when when the Bond alumni connects back to the fans. I give them, as you say, an extra half star easily. Yeah, no, Thank that's you. that's um makes a lot of sense to me too. All right. Um, we're going to end it on this note in the, I, I said it before. I'm going to say it again in the description section are, is the link to Marissa's Instagram. Marissa, will you, by the time this airs, will you do a reels on a, on license to kill? I will. And I will do it for the living day as well. Back and to back. You know where people need to go and make sure you subscribe to her because she's amazing. Not because she's my niece, because she's truly amazing. And Marissa, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. And you didn't go through, you didn't have to hit up your Coca-Cola. No, no. I'm like a quarter of the way through the seltzer. I got a long night to go. It's Oscars night. So it's Oscars quarter. night. You got to pace yourself. I really need to pace myself. Big night for me. All right. Well, this has been Marissa and this has been also David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon with another discussion. Take care. Perfect. That was awesome. Yeah. I'm, hey, listen, I'm glad to... Uh...
Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.